All right, so here we're going to predict whether molecules are polar or nonpolar. We've learned how to draw Lewis structures. We learned how to determine electron domain geometry, uh, axe notation, and molecular geometry. Uh, we've done a lot so far. And so uh, this is probably refreshing to hear that this is a very simple topic. Um, it's really just drawing on the things we've already talked about. So here we have a molecule, uh, uh, bromine, um, molecular bromine. So two bromine atoms bonded together. We've already learned how to draw Lewis structures, so let's just go ahead and do it. Br, Br. It's obviously going to be linear because there are only two atoms. Okay, It's not really a central atom here. Uh, and there should be 14 valence electrons to work with here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We are good to go. There's no charge either. So the question is, is this polar or nonpolar? Well, how are we going to know if a whole molecule is polar or nonpolar? Now, I remember us looking at individual bonds, but here they say, is the molecule, we're looking at the whole molecule, how am I supposed to know if it's polar or nonpolar? Well, we, we're going to have to look at each individual bond, okay? Well, in this case, I've got bromine and bromine, so this is going to be pretty easy. These electrons here, this bromine is pulling on those electrons just as hard as this bromine is pulling on the electrons, right? But they have both have the exact same electronegativities. So that means that the pull of this bromine on this electron in this direction is going to be canceled out by the pull of this bromine of the electron in that direction because these two atoms are the same. Now, if these atoms were different and had different electronegativities, that would be a different story. But in this case, they cancel out, and so this is non-polar, and there's nothing to put here. Okay? Let's look at ammonium. I'm going to draw its little structure. It's going to look like this. And just because ammonium is charged doesn't mean it's polar right off the bat. Okay, it's an ion, but actually ammonium is nonpolar. Let's look at why. Okay, well, let's look at each individual bond. We've done this before. We've looked at bonds and determined whether individual bonds or polar covalent bonds are nonpolar bonds. Let's look at this bond right here. All right, this bond right here. Which one of these is most electronegative? Hydrogen or nitrogen? Well, that would be the nitrogen, of course. So that means that the electrons in this area being shared here are being pulled towards the nitrogen. Okay, we, we call this, I draw a little symbol here, and I'd say that's a bond moment in the direction of the nitrogen because nitrogen is more electronegative. It's pulling electron density closer to it. Well, I've got the exact same kind of bond here, so I should see the same thing. And the same thing here, and the same thing here. Okay? So how do we get nonpolar from looking at this? Well, the thing about determining, uh, predicting whether molecules are polar or nonpolar is you have to consider the molecular geometry in 3D. Let's look at the tetrahedral molecular geometry because that is the molecular geometry of ammonium. One, two, three, four electron domains and no lone pairs. Four electron domains, no lone pairs, tetrahedral. So let's look at this and figure and see if we can figure out how we got nonpolar from this. Okay? You have to look at it three dimensionally. All right? So that bond moment between this hydrogen and this nitrogen atom was in the downward direction here, okay? The bond moment was also in this direction, this direction for that bond, and this direction for that bond. If I'm looking at this, 
And if I'm looking at all of the bond angles that are coming out at me and going into the paper, I will see that they all cancel each other out. So let me erase these and try to help explain it a little bit. Let me make this larger. Let's see if I can make this larger. Okay. Now notice this is coming out at you. This is going into the paper and these are on laying on the paper. Okay. It's kind of flat on the paper. This is jutting out at you and that's going in. Okay. So let's look at each individual bond moment. So we know if this is the nitrogen and these are the hydrogens. Nitrogen is more electronegative. We have a bond moment in the downward straight down direction. Or like if I were plotting on paper, graph paper, X and Y, it'd be straight down on the Y axis. Okay. Here I have a bond moment in this direction. Now notice this is kind of up. And then it's kind of over, right? It's a diagonal direction. And so it doesn't really cancel out all of this. This is straight down, right? This is straight down a pretty good distance where this one kind of only goes up a little bit. See, from here to here, kind of up just a little bit where this goes way down. So it's not really canceled out. Here... We have an arrow going in and up a little bit. And this one goes in in that direction and up a little bit. If I had the model in my hand, and when you guys pull that simulation up and you look at this, you will see that all of these arrows going in their different directions will cancel each other out. Okay, so polarity, when we look at it in under the view of geometry, three-dimensional geometry. You may remember this word from, uh, from math, vectors, okay? It's a vector quantity. When we look at uh, polarity and dipoles, it's a vector quantity. You have to look at the direction of the bond moments and if they cancel each other out. In this case, all of these bond moments and all these little vectors, when you're looking at them, they do cancel each other out. Okay, so that would be nonpolar, nothing to write here. Now let's look at this one. Carbon sulfide, S, S. So that's 12, that's 16 valence electrons to work with. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I've run out. So uh, before I satisfied the carbon octet, this is not boron, beryllium, or aluminum. It needs an octet. So I need to erase a lone pair there, introduce a double bond, erase a lone pair here, introduce a double bond. Okay, so there's the Lewis structure. Let's look at each individual uh, a bond. So I have a double bond here between these two atoms and a double bond here between these two atoms. All right. Which one of these is more electronegative? Well, if you're looking at the difference in electronegativities, they're both pretty much the same. Yeah, 2.5 here and 2.5 here. Uh, so, you know, really, this is a nonpolar bond there. There's no bond moment. There's no pull. Of electrons in that direction are on no bond moment in that direction and because this is the same exact bond as this one we have the same thing so overall this is also going to be nonpolar with nothing there to put now even if uh, the difference in electronegativity between these two atoms was was greater let's say there was a pool right let's say there was a Let's say this was a fluorine and that was a fluorine, uh, however unlikely that may be. Let's say that there was a clear bond moment in that direction and this direction. Well, because of the geometry of this molecule, because it's linear, those vectors, those bond moments are canceled out just like we saw here. Okay? They got one to the right 
and one to the left of the same magnitude but opposite direction completely canceled. All right. Well, what if it was the other way? What if this were more electronegative than the sulfurous? Well, then we have a bond moment towards the carbon for this bond and towards the carbon from this bond. Guess what? The magnitude of these is the same because the bond's the same, okay? But then again, in opposite directions, to the right, to the left, canceled out because of the geometry of this molecule linear.